freedom still to meet and praise your name and preach your word and God be called Christians and God I pray you just deal with every heart man and women boy and girl and I pray when we leave this place we know that we've been dealt with by God Almighty himself and the precious word of God thank you for what you do God please come back let this be that glorious day when you take us home God please in Jesus name we pray amen y'all may be seated
Here. Aren't you going to sing Jeff to her? I'm probably going to sing the tenor. I want to say something about that song. It's my favorite song. It's written by Fanny Crosby. But what you don't know is the, the fellow across the page, Mr. Doan, that wrote the music. They were friends, and when they first became friends, Mr. Doan had his eyesight, and then he had, he got glaucoma, and he lost his eyesight, and Fanny Crosby became incredibly poor during her life, and she came to live with the Doan family, and they spent many hours singing and making hymns, and this is one of them. There's some times when all you have to do is come to the cross be near it. Now this next song we're going to sing was written by Wesley and they knew something about being near the cross and about mm -hmm. fellowship with Jesus. So pray for us as we sing this song. Where is it? Three, two, two. Yes. Three, two, two. yes. Jesus, lover of my soul, let me to thy bosom fly. While the nearer waters roll, while the tempest still is high, guide me on the Savior high, till the storm of life is Save with me the haven guide, oh, receive my soul as last. Other refuge have I none, hang my witless soul on thee. Leave, oh, leave me not alone, still support and comfort me. All my trust on Thee is stayed, all my help on Thee I bring. Cover my defenseless head with the shadow of Thy wing. How, O oh Christ, art all I want, more than all in Thee I find. Cheer the faint, heal the sick, and lead the blind. On the holy air, thy name, I am all unrighteous man. False and full of sin, I am. Thou art hip of truth and I sin when the feeling brings a mount, make and keep me pure within. Thou am I the fountain heart, freely let me take of thee. Bring thou up within my heart, rise to all eternity. Amen. It's okay. You can hardly sing. That's a good thing. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Sometimes the preacher goes to the Lord and says, Lord, what do you want me to preach Sunday? nice when God gives you a sermon, but sometimes he don't. I went to the Lord and said, okay, Lord, what am I going to preach Sunday? You won't give me a sermon. 
He said, you got a whole box of sermons there in your office. Pick one. So I went and God said, that's the one. So this is one. This morning I'd like to preach on the value of Sunday school or there's going to be a test. There's going to be a test. Turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 15. 2 Chronicles chapter 15. He said, how are you going to preach on Sunday school out of Chronicles? Well, you just watch. 2 Chronicles 15 verse number 1. We're going to read down to verse number 7. Let everybody get there. Up at the top it says, Ace is good rain. Amen. Israel had good leaders. Israel had bad leaders. Amen. This is a good one. And the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Obed. And he went out to meet Asa and said unto him, Hear ye me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while ye be with him. And if ye seek him, he will be found of you. Boy, I'd memorize that if I was you. For if ye forsake him, he will forsake you. Now for a long season Israel hath been without a, the true God and without a teaching priest and without law. Boy, that's pretty bad. Uh, I guess they had a movement to defund the police, huh? I guess the, I guess they might have decided the law, the old the old laws that had been enforced for hundreds of years weren't good enough anymore. God said, "Hey, wait a minute!" But when they were in trouble, did they turn unto the Lord God of Israel? Yeah, that's how people are. They don't pray till they get in trouble, and then they pray and saw Him. He was found of them. God's good to people. God's good to people. Even people that don't pray except when they get in trouble. God hears them. God helps them. And in those times there was no peace to him that went out nor him that came in. But great vexation. Vex. Vex. vex <laughs> yeah. Vectation. Well, I'll get it right in a minute. My mouth don't want to say it. My brain's saying it. But it won't come out. Vex. Asians, I got it out, upon all the inhabitants of the countries. And nations, and the nation was destroyed of nation. Oh, that's happening. And city of city, for God did vex them with all adversity. Uh, you been paying attention to what's been happening this year? Hope you've been. We've had adversity. We've had vexations. Be strong, therefore, and let not your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded, Heavenly Father. God, thank you for these promises. Thank you for this warning. Thank you for God being very truthful with your people. Help me this morning to say what you'd have me say and be what you'd have me be. And God, I pray you deal with every heart, man, woman, boy, and girl. Help us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know what the biggest problem in the modern Bible-believing Baptist church or mostly any church you go into? It's ignorance. Ignorance. Christians are a bunch of ignorant people running around today. Oh, we got plenty of smart saints. They can do this and they can do that. And they can, I mean, you know, a lot of them go out and they make uh, you know, piles of money. A lot of them go out and they, they seem to be uh, good at uh, working at their family. Uh, a lot of them, you know, can write books and, and uh, do with numbers. And I mean, a lot of smart people running around in the church. But for some reason, they've turned their back on this book right here. He said, oh, Brother Jeff, they turned their back on the book. Well, I remember the day when the Sunday school class used to be full of people eager and hungry to learn the Word of God. I've spent my life 
Mostly in Sunday school from the time I was 19. Now I've preached on the street. I've preached in rescue missions. I've preached in uh, nearly uh, 600 Baptist churches on, on the eastern half of the United States for seven and a half years. I've been around and done a lot of stuff. But I have spent my time in Sunday school. You know, how many Sunday school kids have grown up and brought their families and stayed in the church? None of them. We don't have any of them. They get so big they figure they don't need the old book anymore. They think it's childish. Maybe they don't consider that Jesus spent at least half of his ministry teaching people. Matthew 4.23. Uh, let me just quote a couple of scriptures to you. And Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sicknesses and all manner of diseases among the people. Matthew 6, 55, sometime later. And in the same hour said Jesus to the multitudes, are you come out as against, uh, this is in the garden by the way, uh, as you, are you come out against the thief with swords and staves for to take me? I sat daily with you. What he sat daily to me? Teaching in the temple, and ye lay no hold on me. Jeremiah 32, 3, 33 says, And they have turned unto me the back, and not the face. Though I taught them, rising up early, teaching them, yet have they not hearkened to receive instruction. That's the end times attitude. Paul said, For their are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision whose mouth must be stopped, who prefer whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. We got more dirty, rotten liars teaching the Bible than we got them by the acre, we got them by the mile, we got them by the pound. Uh, we have whole busloads of them uh, running around the country. I'll tell you, we got them. And American people just lapping it up like ice cream. We have this end times attitude. By way of introduction, I'll tell you this story from John Hopkins University. A professor there asked his graduate students to locate 200 boys aged 12 to 16 and research their family backgrounds. The assignment was to predict their future. The students were sent into the slum areas of the city of Baltimore to find boys. The conclusion reached by the graduate students that 90% of those researched would end up in jail. The final chapter of this study would not be completed for 25 years. When the original 200 students were sought after after 25 years later, John Hopkins sent the researchers into the slum areas again. Some of the group still remained in the slums. Others had moved away to better neighborhoods. A few had died. In all, they were able to locate 180 of the original 200. What they found amazed them. Only four of this group ever landed in jail. Remember, their prediction was 90% was going to end up in jail. The question was what caused this figure to be so low when all indications of the past pointed to a larger number. When the researchers began to ask this question, they found out they were getting the same answer. Well, it was this teacher in blah, 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 blah school. Pressed further, the researchers found that the teacher and all the cagers was one and the same teacher. The boys had all been influenced by the same teacher. The graduate students traced down the teacher now living in a retirement home and inquired about her remarkable influence over a group of boys who were headed for a life of crime. She really could not think of any reason why she would have had this kind of influence finally said, well, I guess all I got to mention is I truly love my students. I truly love my students. Good stuff. I want to bring four things to you this morning about the, the value of Sunday school. 
Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse number 5. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse number 5. I want you to notice this story in Chronicles. It said they were without a, a teacher. They were throughout the law. They had, they had quit teaching and, and, and uh, causing people to learn about the word of God. And notice it said a teaching priests. Uh, part of the job of the priests of the tabernacle and the temple. Were to go out into the countryside. And to teach the people the word of God. Well that's what God has called me to do. I think people forget that a pastor is supposed to be apt to teach. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 5. And it says. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God. With all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. So what does that got to do with teaching? Hold on. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt, what is the next word? Teach them diligently unto thy children. And shall talk of them though when thou sittest in thy, thy house. Thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. In other words, you're supposed to be talking about the Word of God all the time and teaching your kids about the Word of God. Notice in Chronicles, they were supposed to teach about the true God. Look, Buddha ain't the true God, Muhammad ain't the true God, Allah ain't the true God, uh, what's the fight to hoot to hoot somewhere yonder somewhere ain't the true God. Our God is the God Jehovah and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost. That's the true God. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. One and three, three and one, the one in the middle died for me. And then we're supposed to teach Him the truth. You know, the truth is precious, don't you? And it's going to get more precious and more precious as the days go ahead. The Bible speaks about a time in Israel when there was a famine of the Word of God. Not of something to eat, but of, not of water, but of the Word of God. There's a parable about a prophetess that came to Tarconus Superbius, an old king of Rome before the Republic. And she brought nine volumes of a book to sell to the king of Rome. And she demanded quite a high price for them. Thinking uh, it was too much. He refused to buy them. Immediately she took three of the books. And cast them into the fire. And burned them up. Then she said king. I have six books for sale. For the same price. He said I'm not going to pay that for the books. So she gathered up three more. And she threw them into the fire. And burned them up. Well, the king at that time had risen from his throne. And she said, I got three books for sale at the same price. Well, thinking there must be something extraordinary or secret or, or some mystery that he needed to know inside those books. He paid the full price for those three books. That's what's happening to the truth, folks. Folks is throwing it into the fire. Oh, we don't need that old King James Bible anymore. I saw... I saw a little bit of video on C-SPAN of some protesters in front of uh, Lafayette Plaza. I'm going to call it by its name, Lafayette Plaza, in front of the White House. And you know what I saw? I saw about 25 street preachers with signs and scripture verses holding up saying, Jesus saves. And they didn't have any megaphones. And all around them, they were surrounded by a bunch of these uh, goofy protesters that we have nowadays. And they and they had and there was one lady marching up and down between them, and she was saying, "The Bible's a myth. The Bible's a myth. The Bible's a myth." They quote a Bible to you, and then they go to another Bible, and it says something different. I said, "Lord, have mercy." They figured out how apostate Christians are. We ain't got no hope with them people. We need to put out the truth, people. There's tracks back there with the truth in them. I got a whole closet full of Bibles back there. We can put out the truth.
we can put out the truth. And we're supposed to teach the scriptures. Notice in Deuteronomy that the responsibility of the family was to teach the children the book. You ought to have it hanging in your house. You ought to have a Bible in every room. You ought to read it to those kids. You ought to pray with them kids. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 4 says, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Secondly, not only do we have the precepts of obedience found in the Word of God, but we have the precepts of fellowship. The precepts of fellowship. What a fellowship. What a joy divine. Leaning on the everlasting arm. Turn to Titus. Look at Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. Yeah, I know it's on the other end, but you'll get there. Titus chapter 2 verse 7. Titus 2 7. Now Paul is talking to his preacher boy Titus. And he's telling him what to do. What he's going to face. Oh. And it's not, a, it's not an easy picture. Titus 2.7 In all things showing thyself a pattern of good works. Not only are we to teach the Bible, but we're to live the Bible. In doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned. That he that is of a contrary part of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Christian, the ungodly people shouldn't have anything evil to say about you legitimately. Now they will lie about you. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again. Not purloining, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust we should live soberly righteously and godly in this present world. Second Chronicles, he told them to hear and obey. You need to hear and obey. The song says trust and obey. But how are you going to trust in stuff you never heard before? You know, the pews are always empty in Sunday school. We need to come to Sunday school. We need to learn what the Bible says. Well, some of it's boring. Yeah, some of it's boring. But boy, you stick around, you might learn some good stuff. This morning, we studied this thing over on the board. The people on YouTube can't see it. It's over here on the side. But it was the censor. We learned a lot of good spiritual stuff about that censor, didn't we? I, I, I think some of you want to go home and pray. A lady come to the altar during the song service to pray. Hallelujah! She heard and obeyed. And you know what? That'll help us to find God. That'll help us to find God. In Chronicles, did you notice? That if you seek God, He'll be found of you. But if you're forsaken, if you forsake Him, He'll forsake you. Hear and obey, find God, or else you'll be forsaken. Those two points go together. I don't want to be forsaken by God. I want God to be with me. A preacher named Stowell gives this story. About himself. He said, I thoroughly enjoyed working in my yard. I had I got my own system of fertilizing my lawn and cutting it and caring for it. One year when my uh, son jo Joe was in his early teens, I spent all spring getting the yard uh, to look just the way I wanted it to. We had this basketball hoop at the end of our driveway and on several occasions, Joe came along while I was working in the yard and said, Dad, let's play basketball. My response was always, Joe, not right now. I'm busy working in the yard or I've got to trim this edge here or I've got to do the fertilizing now. Late that summer, I visited the hospital on several successive nights to comfort a family whose boy was about Joe's age. And was dying. 
one evening as I drove home, it struck me that I had a boy just like that. And that it was a great gift from God to have a healthy son. And that I had permitted things, a lawn, a bunch of grass, to eclipse the value of the time spent with him. I drove down our street and I saw my beautiful green, wonderfully manicured lawn. And I saw the basketball hoop in the driveway. And I thought to care, I don't, and I thought to myself, I don't care what I have to do tonight. One thing I'm going to do right now is play basketball with my son. I went into the house and opened the door and yelled, Hey Joe, let's play some basketball. The answer came back, not right now, Dad, I'm busy. I was convicted. I wondered how could I ever have let things get to this point with my son. Folks, don't tell God you're too busy. One of these days you might need him. You call upon him and he said, well, I'm busy. I heard you, but I'm busy. Go away. Thirdly, the precepts of seeking God. Turn to, sec turn to 2 Timothy. That's just a few pages back. 2 Timothy, chapter 2. 2 Timothy, chapter 2. <sighs> You know, Second Chronicles talks about times of adversity and vexations of the nation. And it talks about good times and bad times. And you know, we have good times and we have bad times. Second Timothy 2 Timothy 2.1 says, there, Therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses. The same commit thou to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endured hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is not crowned except he strive lawfully. The husbandman that laboreth must be first partakers of the fruit. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. You know, this teacher, Paul is saying, Teacher, Timothy, my son Timothy, you're going to go through a war. You're going to have to fight. You're going to have to have some bad times and good times. And you need to teach the people to seek God in the good times. Verse number two. I mean, that's a pretty good verse. I mean, he's... Committing, he's getting converts, he's teaching them, he's committing to people. And you know what? America has dropped the ball. They did not seek God during the good times. I wonder how many people, how many people in the last four years have decided that they were going to pray more, come to church more, visit Sunday school more, witness more, do good works more to them. Now, somehow, But some had to wait to seek God in their troubles. You seek God in the good times and you seek God in the bad times. And I'm here to tell you, you seek God in the good times, He'll be Johnny on the spot in the bad times. An old preacher said, what do you got on account? What do you got on account? See, God's keeping records, people. In the good times, you get a ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching. You get a check mark. Well, he prayed. He stayed faithful. He went to Sunday school. He did this. He did that. He did that. Then when the bad times come, he says, Angel, look at the ledger. Well, Lord, he did good. He didn't let you down in the good times. He continued to go to church. He continued to seek you. He continued to pray. He continued to teach. And he continued to do what it... God says, okay. Give him what he needs. Send it off. Send, send a double portion for him. The angel looks and says, well, he left off going to church. He had a better job. 
Oh, he didn't send his kids to something they had something else to do. Oh, oh well, it didn't feel good. So, you know, uh, uh, even though the church provided uh, something on the internet or something on the radio, uh, we, we, didn't, we didn't take the time. We had other stuff to do. God said, well, I'm sorry. Let's answer that one because I love him and that one from a mercy and you can let the rest of them go. God is good to people. But don't fool yourselves. You ignore God during the good times. He's going to ignore you some during the bad times. Lastly, we need the precepts of strength from God. Strength from God. Turn to Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah chapter 8. Here's a great passage of scriptures. Talking about when they came back from the land of Babylon. Rebuilt the temple of Solomon. Rebuilt the city of Jerusalem. Yet they were struggling spiritually. Because now they were out of captivity. And some of them had returned to the normal way of just going about life and forgetting God again. Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 9. And Nehemiah which is the Tereshapha, which means governor, and Ezra the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people, said unto all the people, This day is holy unto you. A holy unto the Lord your God. Not you. A uh, holy unto the Lord your God. Weep not, uh, mourn not, weep not, for all the people wept, when they heard the words of the law. So they came to a place and they read in the law. And God got a hold of their hearts and they started weeping. And said, let this day be holy to the Lord. I wish Sunday was holy again. It was a good thing back in the day when the shops were closed. And the amusement parks were closed. And all the things that people had to do was go to church and... Uh, eat with their families and fellowship and rest. That was a good thing. And he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. You know, People that don't come to Sunday school regularly seem to not be as joyful as other people. They seem to have uh, difficulty dealing with life's problems. When we sing, you'll hear Brother Jeff say, Amen, and that's joy bubbling up in me. Man, I'll get at the house and i listen to some of them, and I just got tears of joy streaming down my, my face at times. Because it's so good that God loves us so much. Say, you got problems? Yeah, I got problems. You got worries? Yeah, I got worries. I got cares, just like everybody else. But when I lay my head down on my pillow at night, I do know something. Because I've been reading it since I was 13 years old from this book. That God's going to take care of me. And God's going to help me because I'm one of His children. Because I'm one of his children, I have a debt of service for God. Not every service of God is preaching in the pulpit or going to the mission field. Oh, there's lots of service you can do for God. Showing care and concern about your neighbor. Well, you don't really have to. Ah, uh, Taking that wayward family member and bringing them aside and giving that special attention they need from that godly grandmother or guy, father or mother and pray with them and, and teach them that God can handle the program. You know what happens if you do that? There's a strengthening that happens. A strengthening that happens. You know, most things in this world, the more you use them, the more we're out to get. But there's something unusual about the spiritual fiber of a Christian. 
the more a Christian exercises his spiritual strength, the stronger it gets. The more he learns of the word of God, the better off he'll be. I'm here to tell you this morning that's a that, that if you serve God, you seek God, you learn the truth, and you, you come to the fellowship uh, of those that learn the Bible, and you seek God good times and bad times, and, and you partake of that joy and that strength, and that there's rewards for God's servants. There's rewards for God's servants. 2 Timothy 1.11 says, Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. For the which cause also suffer, I also suffer these things. So Paul had problems. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed. And am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. You know, sometimes when you're working hard, you have to take off your coat. And if you got a helper, you give it to him and say, Here, take this. I'm busy. Go put it over yonder. Here, take this. I'm busy. Keep it for me. Well, Jesus Christ humbles himself and becomes our helper in this life. You know what? We should take all those cumber cumbersome things that wrap us up hinder our work and we ought to hand it to him and say keep this for us Jesus and we're going to get to heaven he's going to give it back to us he said oh yeah by the way I went to the store and bought you a new one <laughs> and the pockets are full of gold there's a story of a man who had a friend who went to Sunday school and he kept calling him poor thing Poor thing. He was a teacher in the Sunday school. And he'd say, poor thing having to teach those little dumb kids in Sunday school. Poor thing indeed. There are a few moments so precious as seeing the dancing eyes of a little child as he sees the big fish made of the bleach bottle literally swallow up the puppet Jonah. And then to see the relief and his whole body relax and settle against the chair when he sees that God took care of Jonah. And he will take care of me too. If I obey him. Or the excited little voice tugging on mom and daddy and say, Daddy, mommy, come see the ten lepers that daddy made well on my paper. Or hear the little whisper in the back row. Mommy, that's my teacher. Or when I receive the fast moving, most enjoyable, most blessed, filled hour of the week. No, I wouldn't trade all that for a comfortable chair in a quiet adult classroom. Who knows that Bible I teach may lead someone to heaven who otherwise might not have known the way. Sorry, my friend. Poor thing isn't me. It isn't me. In you either. The value of Sunday school. It's just not for kids anymore. <laughs> it never was. Matthew 28, 20. Now everybody should know this is part of the Great Commission. The last thing Jesus said. Among those last things. This is what he said before he went home to heaven. He said, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all the way even to the end of the world. Amen. In conclusion, the Great Commission tells us to teach and preach. Linda has a phrase. Sometimes I'll ask her, well, how did I do? She said, well, it was kind of a teachy-preachy sermon. Teachy-preachy. And then sometimes for Sunday school, she'd say, well, that's kind of a preachy-teachy sermon. <laughs> Listen, what? 
So whether you get teacher, preacher, preacher, teaching, you're going to get it. Amen. One with the other. And it's just not the preacher's job. A father who says he believes the Bible to be the greatest book, to be the word of God to us, but leaves it on the shelf to gather dust while he spends hours with the newspaper, magazine, radio, and television in reality is saying, children, the Bible is not too important. You should read it if you have some extra time. Which one of you had not heard a little boy step proudly forth among his playmate and declare, I know that because my daddy said so. He has confidence in you, dear dad, dear mom. And the things which he sees you put first in your life are going to stand out as mighty important to him too. Is your prayer, Lord, fit me to be loved and meditated by my children? Fathers and mothers have a great opportunity as teachers, as any teacher in the world has. You see, that boy or girl in the home has one chance to see if father and mother really believe and practice what they teach. A father who says he believes in Sunday school yet does not go himself is teaching by his actions that he really does not feel it's very important. A father who teaches in uh, love and tolerance to all yet maintains a cruel attitude in his home toward his brothers and sisters in the church is doing wrong to his children which never in this world can be undone. It is pure poison to the mind of children and will most certainly be a stumbling block in the way of that child becoming a good and productive Christian. A teacher said that. A teacher said that. Well, there will be a test. You say, well, I've been coming to class. Well, I don't care. There'll still be a test. Are you ready for the test? Every head bowed and every eye closed. So what's your invitation? Come to Sunday school next Sunday. Heavenly Father, help us as we go home. Help us to consider the value of our Sunday school. Help us to hunger and thirst for the Word of God. God, we need Thee in this hour. Help us to show you that we need you and turn to you. Not the back, but the face. Not the shoulders, but the hands and feet. The eyes, the mouth, the ears. Fill us. God, teach us. And God, help us to have the joy of the Lord, our strength. Protect every one of us as we go. And bring us back to worship and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.